Hey everyone, welcome back and for tuning again live today. It is Monday, April 8th. It is currently 12 noon here on the East Coast of the U.S. And you are currently watching the Skill Building Monday Drawing Group, and we've got a very special uh, live interview today for you. Um, and if this is working for you, please let us know in the comments and in the chat. And please tag a friend who loves tattoos. Maybe it's someone interested in becoming a tattoo artist. Maybe it's a tattoo enthusiast you know. Maybe it's someone looking to get their next tattoo. Tag everyone you know. Help us get that down. Um, it's with your help that we have turned into programs that we have. And welcome to Guy Hutchison's Reinventing the Tattoo Community, where tattooers, apprentices, collectors, and the curious are encouraged to join these live streams, real-world events, to share, inspire, ultimately create their art and tattoos together. We beam out nearly every day and with your help have evolved into a quality network of amazing live, on-demand, tattoo and art shows that have all been receiving rave reviews. You can find Reinventing the Tattoo in both of the app stores, the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store, as well as our Reinventing the Tattoo YouTube channel, our Reinventing the Tattoo Roku channel, which has 12 to 15 different episodes going at any given time, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week as well as all of the major podcast directories such as Apple and Spotify. Or you can do what most people do and just pull up your web browser and do a quick search for Reinventing the Tattoo and you'll find it all, except for the book, which is still currently out of print. And if you come across a copy of it, please let me know. I would like to purchase another copy. Um, I have one that sits in a glass case that never gets touched. I take it out occasionally, wipe it down with a diaper, and then put it right back. But you know, I'm always looking for a new copy. Uh, but no matter where you are tuning in from, you can always get the latest, most up-to-date information all available at www.reinventingthetattoo.com. You can try it out for free. You do not have to get a subscription right away. You can pick one of three different options to try it out. You can pick a sample webinar from the Reinventing the Tattoo Canon, or you can choose to get some free advice about your unique goals from Guy Aitchison, or you can take a comprehensive tattoo history course from Jay Brown. For fellow tattoo history nerds such as myself, you cannot go wrong with the tattoo history course from Jay Brown. It is absolutely fascinating and dives right in the heart and the meat of the history of tattoos. At reinventingthetattoo.com, you can also pull, find a full event schedule with full weekly and special event live stream details. For example, if you wanted to beam into today's interview, ask some questions, or on any other given show, if you wanted to jump in, maybe show off something you're working on, get a critique on something, or ask someone's opinion about something, you can find all of those details on how to join those shows, all available at reinventingthetattoo.com in the event schedule area. At reinventingthetattoo.com, you can also find access to our Reinventing 24-7 channel. It's a lot like our Roku channel. It's got 13 different episodes going at any given time, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. And at the website, you can also find a full host of professional development and on-demand seminars available for purchase from over 20 world-class tattoo artists. Uh, for example, if you wanted to go through and learn how to tattoo like Andre Malcolm, there's a seminar for that. If you wanted to tattoo a soul like Bob Tyrell, well, that seminar is on there too. Maybe you're interested in getting your lettering upgraded. Well, BJ has a seminar on there. All of that and a whole lot more, all available at reinventingthetattoo.com. Once again, if this is working for you, please drop us a comment, let us know in the chat, and please Tack a friend who loves tattoos. We have a number of weekly staple shows we always encourage people to tune into. Starting off on Mondays at 9 a.m., we have Drawing for Tattooers with James Wisdom, where we get to go and discuss basic drawing techniques and strategies to help us get back to our core fundamentals of being a fine artist in this day and age. Uh, once again, that is 9 a.m., Drawing for Tattooers with James Wisdom on Mondays. Following that, you have the Skill Building Monday group here with me, Jason Leeser, at 12 p.m., where we get to go through and work on our skill sets and build some of our skills up 
And uh, maybe it's something we learned the week before in the Monday evening course. Maybe it's, you know, something that, you know, we want to be better at. All of that and a lot more is practiced here on the Skill Building Monday drawing group. Following that at 9 p.m. on Monday, a subscriber's exclusive drawing group with Sandy McAndrew of the Reinventing Tattoo Network. And that will go through and each week. We try to tackle a different chapter in the Reinventing the Tattoo canon. So if you are a subscriber and you have a subscription to the Reinventing the Tattoo Evolution or the Reinventing the Tattoo canon course, or if you have the Monday evening subscription course, um, you can go through and join us live Monday evenings at 9 p.m. Following Monday on Tuesday at 11 a.m., we have the Tattoo Weekly Show with Dave Ripley, Lauren Gregory, and Fawn Baker, where we get to go through and discuss current events and current topics in the tattoo industry. Maybe it's new legislation being passed, maybe it's um, you know, new developments, pigments or machines or anything of that nature, anything that might potentially impact the industry. That's all discussed and a whole lot more. And that's the Tattoo Weekly Show, 11 a.m. on Tuesdays. Um, definitely a great source of current information in this industry. Following that on Wednesdays at 12 noon, we have the Tattoo Now Show with Rip where we get to go through and discuss some of the business aspects behind tattooing, whether it's marketing strategies or advertising. It's a way to streamline your client booking process, or, you know, maybe you're trying to get a travel visa to go and work in another country. All of that and more is discussed during the Tattoo Now show with Gabe Ripley, Wednesdays at noon. Following that and kicking off Week, Thursdays at 6 p.m., we have the Tattoo Collecting 101 podcast with Fawn Baker, where we get to go through and discuss and share some of our stories about our tattoo collections and the adventures we've had along the way. Now, Reinventing the Tattoo does have a number of special events coming up uh, starting May 17th through 19th in Columbus, Ohio. Reinventing the Tattoo will be by the Hell City Tattoo Convention. And you would not believe the lineup of tattoo artists that we have coming to this show. Uh, special guest artists include Paul Booth, Derb Morrison, Joe Capobianco, uh, a legend in his own right. Joe is someone I've always looked at their work. Also a great human being. Uh, Jimmy Litwalk will be there. Nico Perez, Ty McEwen, James Vaughn, Jesse Levitt, Ron Earhart. Marshall Bennett, and of course, myself, will be tattooing alongside my very good friend, Seth Mushrush. Um, we will all be there and a whole lot more. So if you're looking to get tattooed at the Health City Show, by all means, please find your favorite artist, reach out to them, and book an appointment now. Following that, on 23rd through 25th in Columbus, Ohio, Reinventing the Tattoo will be live at the Red Tree Gallery for a whole of seminars over a few days. Um, a lot of these seminars are going to be more business related. So if you are a tattoo artist and you are looking to go through and take some business seminars uh, in the tattoo industry from tattoo artists um, that will go through and maybe help you uh, polish up your business skills, take a look. That is Reinventing the Tattoo Live at the Red Tree Gallery, June 23rd through 25th. I'd like to go through real quick and take a moment to thank some of our sponsors, some of the people that make these shows happen. Starting off with WorldTattooEvents.com, the largest, most comprehensive resource for tattoo events worldwide. They're constantly keeping everything updated. As we know, living in this post-pandemic era, there are still tattoo events and conventions getting rescheduled. So if you are looking for the most current and up-to-date tattoo event and convention information coming to a city or town near you, or maybe it's one you plan on visiting, Lord knows that's how I schedule all of my vacations, take a look at worldtattooevents.com. We'd also like to thank tattoonow.com, technology for tattooers, the leading edge in professional development, management, and digital tools for tattooers of all levels. 
They're 100% competitive with any type of CRM mailing list and scheduling software out there. So if you're really looking for the digital tools to help you get more clients through the door that get want to get the kind of work that you really want to do, if you're really trying to streamline your client booking process so that it's efficient and effortless and everything is through the silk, take a look at TattooNow.com. They have been a leader in this industry for over 20 years. And of course, this wouldn't be reinventing the tattoo without a very personal and professional thank you to Guy Aitchison at GuyAitchison.com. He is the founder and inspiration behind reinventing the tattoo. You can go to GuyAitchison.com where you can pick up a copy of his Biomech Encyclopedia, some of his custom uh, tutorial DVDs. Occasionally, I think he still has a few custom tattoo machines for sale, as well as countless fine art prints and the occasional oil painting as well, all available at GuyAitchison.com. Would also like to say a very quick and special thank you to Amy Nichols over at the Apprenticeship Diaries, the number one resource for people that are looking for more information on what a tattoo apprenticeship is like. Um, and you know, maybe you're looking for information, maybe you are a tattoo apprentice, and you want to know what a not so good one is like, so you can compare yours to that. Take a look at the Apprenticeship Diaries with Amy Nichols. Um, it is a great podcast. I cannot uh, say too many good things about it. So take, you know, take a look. As always, we ask that if you like today's show, please post a positive review on the channel. Help us get the word out. If you would like to host a Reinventing the Tattoo event, become a sponsor of our community, or if you are looking for a fine art or a tattoo critique, you can always email management at reinventingthetattoo.com. We will get back to you just as soon as we can. And make sure to hit that like and subscribe button down at the bottom of the page so that you can stay up to date with all of the new shows and episodes coming out on all of our channels and all of our podcasts. That way you don't miss anything else. So without further ado, um, I would like to go through and thank today's um, very, very special guest and introduce him. We've got Andrew Swarbrick, if I'm pronouncing that correct. Yeah, Andrew Swarbrick. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. I, I hate butchering people's names, but um, all good, man. yeah, thank you for uh, joining us. And you're joining us all the way from Christchurch, New Zealand. That's... Yeah. Um, quite a bit of a time difference there yeah yeah it's tomorrow there we're yeah. uh we're the ninth at the moment it's four in the morning on the on the oof. ninth oof that's that you, you, oof. that's rough i mean i'm usually <laughs> up until 2 a.m but like four, four yeah i do it different... at the other end i'm usually up at five so it's not like huge oh okay for me, but it's still okay it's still pretty early yeah yeah so tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, where are you from? Where do you work? Um, you know, what's your background like? Uh, from Christchurch. Um, I, um, yeah, I started tattooing 20 years ago this year. Um, so yeah. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's a I'm great officially, milestone. Um, yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah, 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 yeah. Nothing makes me feel more old than starting a job as an adult and then finding out I've been doing it for 20 years. So, um, no, it was, it's, it's quite cool to be at that stage, but yeah, no, been, um, I started here at a tattoo, uh, tattoo studio called the left hand path, um, which I later, um, became the owner of and, um, we're, we're still going strong here. So, um, just after, or just before the, um, COVID lockdowns, we, um, we made it into a private studio and, um, and we've been working out here in uh, in rural Canterbury in um, in in New Zealand for um, the last geez, what's it, four years now, five years, crazy. And um, yeah, just uh, just sort of um, smashing it out out here, getting our clients out, and they can look at the mountains and cows and stuff, and I can give them some cool um, pictures. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Now, do you have any kind of formal art education or background, or is it mostly just self-taught? Because, you know, looking at some of your oil paintings and looking at some of the art that you create, I mean, you're taking everything to a whole new level. Um, you oh, know, is that, 
did you have any kind of formal instruction in that? So no, uh, well, yes and no. I had um, it's it's all self taught um, before tattooing, and um, yeah, I was um, I was working in a factory, and um, and just drew in my breaks or when I was supposed to be monitoring my machine, uh, I'd be drawing. Um, and yeah, the only sort of formal training I've gotten everything <clears throat> in anything is like I went and did a um, a, a three day workshop at uh, Jeff Gogway's um, about 10 years ago now and just to do oil painting. So he, the technique that I use is the one that he, um, that he taught us um, at that workshop and I've just sort of run with it a bit, you know, like I've added in a lot of more of my own sort of what, how I approach things, but it's all, it's all self-taught. It's all watching videos or, or I'm old enough to uh, to be one of the ones that had to had to buy books and read yep. them about it because there weren't there was no instructions online or uh, there was no you know DVDs that weren't just how to paint scenery and stuff you know so yeah uh, it's yeah the ninety five percent self taught. That's awesome, man. I mean, obviously the stuff that you're putting out, just looking at what's behind you, is impressive to say the least. Oop. So <laughs> bravo on that. Um, so what, what led you to get into tattooing? Um, was there like um, an event or just an inspiration? Or? Yeah, I fell into it. It's, 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 it's hard, especially being someone who's been in tattooing, like the, the amount of time I have, um, you know, getting into tattooing is such a battle um, for so many people. And it's, it still was for me. My initial in was very easy, but then it was very, very hard to, my apprenticeship wasn't an easy one by any means. Um, but yeah, I got fired from my factory job for drawing on the quality control forms instead of filling them out. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I made a bunch of um, defective product. And um, yeah, I was, I, as soon as I actually did the quality check, um, just because I used to work night shift just in the morning before my boss got there, I'm like, oh yeah, this is, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> wow. So yeah. Um, so yeah, I um I got um over here you get um by law you get paid a certain amount of holidays a year. Um a paid holidays a year. <clears throat> and I had some of those built up. So it, when you get terminated from your job, you you you're owed that money. So I got a few few weeks worth of holiday pay paid out and I um I used that money to get very drunk. Um but I also had uh, a little bit left to get a tattoo. So I went to get a tattoo. And I had drawn this tattoo over over many nights at the um, at the factory, and then forgot to take it with me. So I just asked the guy if he had a pen because I'd drawn everything in ballpoint pen, and um, just drew it in front of him. And uh, he's like, "Oh, no, you are you an artist?" I was like, "Yeah." And he goes, "Oh, um, do you have a portfolio?" And I was like, "Yep." And he goes, "Well, book you in for tomorrow and bring your portfolio in." And uh, it was. You know, any chance to show off when you're a 22, 22-year-old um, uh, up-and-coming artist. And so, yeah, I took, took all my stuff in and he was, I took a, yeah, I had a portfolio of probably 200 um, ballpoint pen drawings. And, um, yeah, he just got about halfway through it and started talking about how you would go about becoming a head of apprentice. So, so um I asked him if he was offering me a job and he was like, I'm offering you the opportunity to maybe get a job. And um, I went from there. So I just started going in and mopping floors and cleaning tubes and making sure all the books on the shelves were straight and that sort of mundane shit um, until he finally, um, and it's without a word of a lie, handed me Guy Epsonson's book and said, go home, read that. And then once you've read that, um, I'll start teaching you how to tattoo. So I did. Yeah. And that's how I, that's uh, awesome. that's how I started my apprenticeship. So I sort of fell into it. <clears throat> I didn't really, all, my experience of tattoos up to that stage had been just old school sort of stickers. You know, I didn't know many people with tattoos and I didn't really view it as something that I wanted to get into. And then once I sort of was introduced by my mentor to like Paul Both and and stuff like that, I, I, I suddenly could see the potential for, for tattooing, apart that wasn't just 
reproducing other people's work. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome, man. I you know, it's it's interesting too because you said, you know, you were handed Guy Itchison's book and I've heard mm-hmm. that from so many prominent tattoo artists in today's <laughs> world. They're like, "Oh man, it all started. I got a copy of this book from this guy named Guy Itchison and, and you know, it just it completely changed my perspective on a lot of things. And I mean, I'm one of them. You know, I picked yeah. up a copy of his book when it first came out when it was a three ring binder. Um, and I yeah, still have one, it to this day. <laughs> yep. And, um, you know, I remember reading that while I was in college and I was going to art school and mm. I learned, I ended up learning more from that book, just about fine art, perspective, depth, uh, contrast, uh, the ways that everything worked in the fine art world mm. than I ever did when I was in you know, college, Mm. one of my art professors actually went through and said, you know, listen, we noticed like a a pretty, you know, drastic, significant change in the work that you were doing when you first started this semester and the work Mm -hmm. that you're doing now, they were like, you know, and this was someone that was like running one of the art departments. Um, They were like, what was it something the professor said, or was it something that, you know, that was like an aha moment, like we're trying. And I was like, no, in all honesty, like the reason for this shift had nothing to do with taking these classes. It had everything to do with reading this book. Yeah. Um, and they were kind of floored by that. And they were like, but tattooing isn't fine art. And I was like, oh, oh, yeah. oh but it is. Yeah. Um, you know, so it, yeah, it's a, just a awesome to see that. From, um, the sort of um, the art education um especially sort of higher education with that. I, I don't know what it's like now, but yeah, I went to go to university to do my fine arts degree as a, as an adult student while I was like, just after I'd finished my apprenticeship and, um, and yeah, they, they were really impressed with my work. They really, really liked my portfolio, all that sort of stuff. And the instant that they were like, that they found out that I was tattooing, it was just, nah, there's no place for you. Yep. So yeah, I, I wanted to go there. I thought there might be something I was missing out on because I could glean so much information from books and, um, you know, little tidbits of, from people. And I thought, wow, if I can be formally trained in this for four years, you know, I'll, I'll be awesome. And, um, and, and yeah, it's sort of, especially over here, I think, in a fine arts degree, um, uh, you, 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 the, the practical element of what you get taught is probably only about 20% of the degree. The rest of it is is all the things that surround the, the, the fine art world um, in terms of writing about your own art and critique and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Which so, is... <laughs> so what really kind of drives you in life? Um, you know, what, is there any specific motivation or anything like that? That's really kind of drove you to really progress, to really kind of elevate yourself, to constantly do better um, to improve in both fine art and tattooing any specific thing you can really point to um yeah I, I guess so i think i think the main motivator for me was i was just it was my it was it was my thing that i was good at i you know i um was born with quite a number of disabilities and um some of them are more noticeable than others um but was always a, a point of difference and um you could i personally felt like i was behind the other kids at school so when i was you know you receive praise for doing something and, and and it's quite a level playing field you know um anyone who can hold a pencil um so i sort of attacked that and then i spent a bit of time in hospital as a kid and um back then there were no tvs in the children's wars one tv in the child's ward they used to wheel it in on a trolley you know how they used to do that at, at schools at video time and they'd wheel in the VCR. oh yeah so, yeah so once a week you got tv you know uh but the rest of the time i was just drawing so mum um used to bring in comic books um the 2018 magazine judge dread stuff like that and i would oh, um yeah. yeah that was that was the stuff that i cut my teeth on so i used to just copy simon bisley and um and those and Greg Staples, those sorts of artists, um, and uh, 
yeah so it meant, it meant the, the artwork that i was doing as a as a 12 year old was just you know massive cyborg dudes with chain gun arms just eviscerating <laughs> hordes of aliens you know like just blood and guts and and, and big tits and shit like that you know and um but it meant that by the time i got to high school um i had i i was i had a really a big base of skill the year that a lot of kids probably wouldn't have because they just wouldn't have had the time to put the hours in like i had so i just sort of that became my thing that was my point of difference where i could i could feel that i would positively stand out in the crowd rather than the way that i felt i stood out which was in my mind negative so i just kept pursuing that and it was always a a sort of a dream that i could do something with it you know my family is um they're a working class family everyone's got a, a job yeah um and, and it was a, a thing that was like maybe i could do something else um yeah so that was the sort of driver for that and, and for me at the moment and you know and, and through adulthood and that it was just seeing how good i could get you know i'd, I'd look at a I, I search for artists that floor me I'm like, how do they do that? And then I figure it out. I try to figure out how they do the thing that they do and then see if it's something that I could use to sort of help me express what I'm doing. And I think I've got to the point now that I've filled up that skill tree to the point that I could actually start playing with it rather than rather than just striving to get better. I can strive to sort of just create be more me i'm just that's where i'm at at the moment artistically i think is i'm just finding what it is that i want to say with the skill set that i've built yeah so long answer yeah yeah great answer though uh, phenomenal you. uh so you did touch on um jeff gogue and guy um mm -hmm. who would you say some of your other really big influences are who are some of those artists that you would look at that really floored you um that really kind of made you look at them and say how did they do that that's incredible um you know any any specific people uh that you really look at yeah i think i think um early on Definitely, because they were just they were doing stuff that um, I'd never seen done before. Was was Paul and, and Guy. Um, we had a couple of Joe Capabianco's books um, in the studio, and I I love I love that shit. And um, I've had the opportunity to meet him and hang out and stuff. And, and he's a he's a super super duper cool guy. Um, yeah, such a nice guy. Um, you put me on the spot. I've got notoriously terrible with names um but yeah those I, th th that sort of thing was definitely right up there for me and, and, and sort of later on it was jeff's work jeff Dogway's work just sort of seeing how to um combine sort of different styles philip blue um horiyoshi that sort of stuff just large scale beautifully flowing thought out pieces um really really impressed me um, when 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 you can see whether or not it's through sort of brute force um, skill and hours put into a piece you know getting them composed properly and the and the focal points and colors and contrasts um, going together or if it's um, an innate ability to to render that out of your head um, it, it, that really impresses me we see large scale um, stuff like that where they the the whole body is one canvas or or you know you get a you get a dragon that starts at someone's ankle and ends you know on their shoulder it's i fucking live for that stuff there eh? yeah that's awesome man yeah a lot of the same influences over here as well i mean i think we all started by seeing something paul booth did or mm. you know guy or jeff or you know for me a big one was philip um, you know, I remember looking at his stuff and just thinking like, how did this guy get to this level? And, mm -hmm. you know, how, how is he coming up with these inspirational things that he's coming up with? How, yeah. how did he get to the point where he's thinking so outside the box yet he's still applying it and everything makes sense, you know? Yeah. And it just, yeah, yeah. his work's really, 
really stand out. Blew my mind. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've managed to meet him a couple of times. He's once again like like all the like all the people that are at the tippy top of their game. They're just so nice and easy to talk to. And he's yeah, um, he's a very genuine human. But like the, yeah, his work is mind blowing. Yeah, I, I'm really just always fascinated. My friend Pete, um, he lives out in New Jersey, maybe an hour and a half away from where I live, um, has a full bodysuit done by Philip. Oh, wow. And yeah, uh, I mean, we're talking, you know, collar to ankles, you know, all the way down to his wrists. And it's every time I look at it, I'm finding something new with it, you know, mm-hmm. and it's this mm-hmm. big koi fish jumping out of water. But it's the same image of a koi fish on both front and back, but it's the two different sides of a koi fish. Yeah, wow. Right? So it's, and where it wraps, where it joins on the body, how all the scales look perfect when his arms are up, when his arms are down, how Mm. everything is just so cohesive, no matter which way he's standing or turning or mm. what he does, everything that whole image is flawless, no matter how you look at it. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's just always, it always floors me every time I hang out with him. You know, I'll just like sit back and I'll look at a part of it and I'll pick out something new. And it's like, man, that's thinking on a completely different level than I've seen a lot of other artists think. Mm. You know, mm. um, yeah, starting with those sort of large shapes and flow, much. Yeah, it's all a nice book, really, isn't it? But it's 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 yeah. that it's for me when I'm doing something like that, it's always thumbnails, starting with a thumbnail, and if you can get if you can get something to look interesting and good and flow well when you're when you're drawing it two inches by one inch um, for a back piece, um, then then you can only build on that. It will only improve as you get bigger and bigger. If you if you know. What I've found is if you start with it too big, you can get way too interested in the cool thing that you want to do or the, the particular element that interests you or the detail. And and um, if you've got if you don't have that initial massive flow or, or, or sort of weight of the image um, down for a start, you, you're polishing a turd. You know, it's it's not you need but it's never quite going to be as good as it could be. You know, you can see that with a lot of the a lot of the artists that just do large sort of new style tribal or um, sort of filigree style tattoos where they do whole back pieces or body suits and that sort of stuff. And it's all flow and weight in contrast. And if those can look amazing and you use those same rules applied to what you're doing, you know, it's, you're, always, you're going to end up with a, a, a piece like that where, as you said, you just constantly you can go back to it and find more and more things that are, that are just really cool about it, you know? Absolutely. Mm. So what would, uh, knowing that you work very heavily with oil paints and that you're <laughs> very, very good with oil paints, um, out, you know, when we're talking art outside of doing tattoos, um, yeah. you know, what would you consider to be your primary medium? Um, do you or, are you strictly or, oil paints? Do you dabble in other mediums as well? Um, um, yeah, no, I sort of I, my my bandwidth is only so big, so I've I've sort of the majority of my time is taking up <clears throat> oil painting. I still do my sketches in ballpoint pen. I um because you can't you have to sort of deal with what you, the marks you put down. You can't fiddle with it too much. Start a new one and, and uh, um, if the if the one that you're working on is no good. Um, keep your drawing. Um, but I do a bit of digital stuff. Um, I use that primarily for uh, um, sort of tattoo um, designs, but I, I also can, I'll do like thumbnails or maybe sketches for paintings and stuff like that using um, Photoshop, just painting on Photoshop. Uh, and I've started to, um, I've, I do a bit of sculpture and stuff. I play, um, <clears throat> well, I used to play Warhammer 40K, so I do a bit of like miniature painting and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, uh, I've just started learning Unreal Engine. Um, okay. Yeah, which is a gaming engine. Um, it's what they used to do all the um, background shots and stuff for the Mandalorian series. And uh, 
I've been, I was watching nerd videos on that, how they do that stuff. And I found out that you can get the program for free. Um, so I did. And um, yeah, that, that's cool. This sort of world building in there and stuff, a bit of, a bit of creativity that's not on canvas. It's like in its own little world. I, I find that very, very, very cool. But yeah, the majority of what I do is um, oil painting or, or aim towards oil painting um, if it's not for tattoos. Awesome. Um, so have you noticed any kind of a correlation between, um, say your oil paintings and some of the sketches that you do and the tattoos that you produce, or do you try to keep the subject matter for your oil paintings as more of like a separate fun thing that you do outside of tattooing, or do you try to mix and mash both together? Um, I found that they, um, they inform one another. They have informed one another over the years so i i was trying to do oil painting things when i was first started oil painting and um and tattoo things were, were different and then um i started you know some of the things you get to do when you're tattooing because of the restrictions put on you by your client <clears throat> you, you have to think outside of the box how do i make this cool or unique <clears throat> so you start forming a, a visual language in your own Sort of tattoo work and, and i and i enjoyed that and it was fun so i wanted to enjoy it and have fun while i was painting so i started bringing in some of those elements into the paintings and then the paintings got weirder and then the paintings weirdness outstripped the, the tattoos weirdness so then i started feeding that back into how i tattoo so you know i would love to tattoo this all day like that i'd tattoo oh, shit out of that you sick. know like that that's a back piece somebody get it um but yeah, just just the the crazier the better, and the more elements, the more different elements that don't go together, um, the better. I, I want to um, see how I can combine those things, you know, like and um, yeah, they to, to to go back to your question, it's yeah, it's a feedback loop for me. They inform one another, um, but they have both the things that I've learned through tattooing have informed the painting, which is then fed back into the tattooing like down the line that's that's fascinating to hear um you know out of all of the interviews that i've done um you know i get a lot of people that say you know i try to keep them separate you know i like to try to keep my paintings my paintings and my tattoos my tattoos and yeah you know i try to keep one for fun and then you know one's more work related and maybe it's not always the most fun then it you get other people that go through and they'll say, Oh, well I paint like I tattoo and I tattoo like I paint. So, you know, it's all one and the same to me. It's just, you're using a different medium. Mm. Um, but this is, this is the first time I've heard that it's kind of like that progressive feedback loop where mm. you're yeah. playing around with something on in one and then that's influencing the other. Then you're drawing from that and bringing that back into the, the first medium. So it's it's fascinating to see the way that that's that works. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's never cool. an answer I've had before. Oh wow, so that's, a, that's awesome. I'm unique. I'm a I'm a I'm a flower. It's lovely. No, I, yeah, I, I yeah I I have heard that other stuff, and it, <clears throat> I get it. I get I get keeping them separate, and I get um I get how one can be fun and one one is more work. But for me, I think I've I've tried doing that, but the more I've sort of I think for me, because I was restricting what I was doing and painting so much, I had a set of rules in my head that I was adhering to, whether or not I was conscious of that. <clears throat> the more I let those go <clears throat> and brought in the elements of the tattoo, the sort of freedom that I have in tattooing, it sounds weird because you've, you've got clients and it's you know, quite free, but I really push weird shit on my clients and a lot of them are um, the, the, the few that, that really let me go get rewarded with really cool pieces and um and i was like wonder wonder if i could do that you know like i i think of a painting i'm like nah no one's no one wants to see that shit and then any time i paint that any time i say that in my head no one wants to see that shit if i paint it it's the most popular painting i've done it's, it, yeah it's weird any time i think no fuck people people don't want to see that people <laughs> I paint it and then people go fucking what and and it's because it's because of that you know like there's that yeah 
yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to put into words, but yeah, any time I let go of my own restrictions and let it go, the better it works. And so that's what I've done with both of those. I've just sort of like, if I, <clears throat> it's kind of an arms race between the two, is, is which one can get more weird now. They're both trying to keep up. Fascinating. Um, so knowing that this is a, a more tattoo centric show, I did want to mm-hmm. try to dial that back in to tattooing. Um, so how would you kind of categorize the style of tattoos that you do? Would you say it's more weird or surrealist or, uh, maybe it's more, you know, color realism or just abstract, you know, color. Yeah. I think if Uh, I had to, if I had to categorize it, it would be color surrealism. So just it's, I strive to achieve, um, or, or to include realistic elements, um, be it be it the, the form or the shading, um, you know, um, in the tattoos, I try to have them, even when I'm creating fantastical things that, that can't exist in, in reality, I try to give them um, some realism in there, like how they're executed. Um, but yeah, I'll, you know, one of, one of my favorite pieces I've done is the, um, is a back piece of a, a tardigrade that's made of like, galactic scale tardigrade that's eating a, a neutron star and then all of the accretion disc is made of fish um and it, it's just the weirdest fucking thing but i've i've done it in a way that it's kind of believable it makes sense and um and that's that's sort of what i go for in my in my work i try to i try to just <clears throat> wing stuff in there that is, is crazy it just just run with my ideas but then make it cohesive and make it make sense so i think Surrealism works for that because it's, you know, like most surrealists, you'll see it. It's, yeah, it's realistic elements that have been put into a, an unrealistic environment, I guess. Right on. Mm. Um, so if you had to pick like one element that you really try to emphasize in mm. either your paintings or your tattoos, um, you know, one kind of artistic element to that you really, really try to dial in on. Um, what would you say it is? You know, I through an interview with Jeff that I remember watching a while back, you know, he really tries to focus on line quite a bit and making sure that, you know, his lines are awesome. And if he can have a perfect line drawing, he knows that anything he does after that, it's only going to get better. Um, and you know, through talking to other people, they focus more on contrast or the sense of depth mm. or color mm. palette, you know, and they really want to have these dynamic colors in there. So if you had yeah. to pick one thing, what would you really say it is? Yeah, well, I think that's the hardest question so far, one thing. Um, yeah, all of the things. Um, if, if it's one thing that I think I'm known for, um, that I think I'm consciously pursuing would be saturation. So um, that sort of goes with contrast and color as well. Like um, one of the things that I enjoy, I love it when it happens, um, is people will see one of my pieces that they've seen online in real life, like at a convention or whatever. And, And excuse my language, but they're like, fuck, like that looks like it does in the picture. Um, and I think that people are so used to seeing things that have been dialed up online and they're so much more bright, so much more saturated um, than they really are. My, my stuff isn't. My stuff is like that. It's, it's, that's what it looks like. And it heals saturated and solid. And, and I think that a lot of people that are attempting that sort of realism and <clears throat> stuff like that in their tattoos, is that's a thing that they, they can be overlooked, is that fundamental solidity of tattoos that's what makes a tattoo a good tattoo is it flows well and it's solid and it and it lasts um so even when i'm doing my hyper realistic bright craziness i try to bring those elements and that are going to give it that longevity you know if I, if I do a bunch of bright colors i'm going to have them right next to just solid black um so that as those colors age 
which in fade they do so in an order that makes it so that it still looks correct as it as it ages. Awesome. So you you did mention you know you like to work with these really bright colors. How do you really determine your color palette? Um, you know, is are there specific colors you tend to stick to? Are there certain colors you try to avoid? Um, you know, is there any kind of insight you can give us into your your specific color palette? Just looking yeah. at the pieces behind you, I can see you know a wide range from these gorgeous golden yellows and some of the buildings to these vibrant neon pinks and electric blues. Um, yeah. You know, any any insight there? I think um, I, I I have. There's a couple of sort of color sets that I always go to, um, sort of by default. But I think it's less about the colors and more about the the sort of the contrast in the colors. So I I try to whatever colors the champion color it could be it could be decided by the the client or or by me is I'll just make sure they're contrasting. So there'll be a like a warm color and a cold color, and that's. It's super basic, but you can take basic. Well, that's what all artists are taking a very basic concepts and repeating them or making them very, very complicated by, you know, dialing them in. But yeah, with with, with what I do with with my color choices is I'll generally go, okay, the main light source or if there's a light source in the tattoo, that'll be warm or cold. And then the background color or the complementary sort of um, lighting that's coming in from the back will be the opposite color. It sort of it lends a lot of depth, and you can really tweak it to help with flow and and and, and showing in form and and volume in, in a piece. Um, so I think that's yeah, especially with the colors. I mean, like the colors that I I, I think most of mine are known for is all the, these sort of hot pinks and stuff like that, sort of the magenta type scale of color, and um and the and the mint greens, sort of the, the neon. Um, cold mint green colors are um, it just I know they look good I know they heal well um, I know they'll really pop against a, against a very very dark contrasty piece um, and I, I, I just really enjoy doing that but there's not really any colors I avoid I, it, it it confuses me a little bit when when people when artists avoid using particular colors in their tattoos um, and I've heard I've heard of various reasons why um, some of them have had issues. I think mainly the ones I've heard of are orange and yellow lasting um, their longevity. Um, early on, I had a couple of pigments that really, a couple of yellows in particular that just wouldn't go in to some clients. I just I I do pull out all the tricks and they just wouldn't go in. But yeah, I had a quite a long conversation a number of years ago with a very well known tattooist who really avoided using oranges in his pieces because they fell out. And I, I very nearly just took him at his word and stopped using them, but I didn't. And I'm glad I didn't because yeah, I've had a couple of clients come back after 10 years and get their second sleeve done and all the oranges and stuff are still there. So I don't I don't know. I think it you know, some clients or some pigments just might not work with the technique you're using. But yeah, I think that I think those color choices are mainly for me based on contrasting between the colors. If I, yes, I'll pick one that's warm and then by default, I'll pick the cold color and vice versa. Right on. Now, do you prefer to work on larger multi-session pieces or do you prefer to maybe stick to stuff that's smaller, like one shot? Um, you know, do you prefer to work with, you know, say someone that comes in, wants to get a sleeve done, you're like, sweet that I know that's going to be, you know, six, seven, nine, 12 sessions or whatever, um, or back pieces, or do you really like to see that tattoo done start to finish one day and then maybe add another piece later and then another piece later? Yeah. Um, you know, what's what's your kind of mindset when it comes down to scale of projects? They're all they're all big multi day pieces. Um I I would love to be faster. I would love to be able to smash some of these out in a day and and some of the um the work that I've seen on Instagram, the, the amount of work that people can get done in a day blows my mind. Um it's it's really impressive stuff, but 
yeah, unfortunately for my poor, poor clients, um, they're usually thousands and thousands of dollars into a multiple session sleeve and it all looks like garbage <laughs> until it's done. Um, I, I try to, I try to, in the first or session session, depending on how much I know that they're committed to what they're doing, I'll try to have one bit finished so that they can hold on to that. Like, you know, anytime you see the rest of your arm and think about the money and, and go, what the fuck is this? You know, look back at your forearm at that base. The whole thing's going to look like that. You can hold on to that. You know, um, but yeah, I think large multiple day stuff. It, it, it's it's not what you want um, to be insta famous. It's not what you want for the the modern um, some of the aspects of, of tattooing where you want that completed picture to be able to show people all the time. And it sucks be, uh, doing some of the big pieces sometimes because, you know, you can spend 10, 20 sessions on something and then you get one picture of it and here it is, you know, whereas if you'd done 20 small ones, you'd get 20. Um, right, right. Yeah. But um, I personally enjoy looking at other people's work that's like that. I love seeing big pieces and they impress me and I can, I know the amount of work that's gone into them. I just think they look cooler. So I like the bigger stuff. Right on, right on. Um, so what have been some of the biggest challenges that you've faced in the past um, in creating art and tattoos and, um, you know, anything dealing with your career thus far? Um, anything specific that really stands out to you as far as a challenge that you had to overcome? Um, I think early on, like very early on, it was, I, yeah, I think very early on, it would have been convincing other tattooists and older tattooists that what I was doing was legitimate and would last. So when I started doing realism, especially the colour realism. <laughs> Not many people were doing it. And, um, excuse me. Don't kill it. Um, and, yeah, I I just remember doing stuff at, at, at conventions or, or um, yeah, mainly at conventions. I'd be doing stuff at conventions or they'd see my work portraits and colour realism and stuff at conventions and they'd be like, oh, there's no lines on that. That's just all going to fall out. I, I tried doing that in the 80s or I tried doing that in the 70s and it never worked. And, um, you know, the, the, the tattoos need to be this particular way to, to work or to last. And unfortunately, the, the, the only way to prove that that wasn't the case was to do these tattoos and then after five years they hadn't fallen out you know, and they hadn't faded. And then um, to give them credit, most of them were like, wow, that's really cool and you've done an amazing job. But um, there were still the holdouts where the goalposts kept moving, you know, oh, I'll see it after 10 years. And then, you know, 10 years, oh, I'll see it after 20 years. And it's like, cool, cool, man. You know, you can see that. I think that was the, the hardest bit was getting that um, acceptance by the rest of the community at, at that stage. And then it sort of became the next big thing where realism was was how to how to impress people very very quickly was to was to do a color portrait or something like that and there were a lot of people out there that were very very good at what they did but for me those fundamentals were always a huge part of it you had to have that those high contrast and a lot of black in your work to make it hold and a lot of my work was very very bright and had a lot of colors in it and it really stands out but when you look at it there's a ton of black there's at least a third of it will be black um, and there were people then that were quite well known that it was just all colour, and, and you can see that it's really good, but that's not that's not going to hold over the time. So I think having that style of tattoo become legitimised in the tattoo industry, um, I personally felt difficult, um, but a lot of people did a lot of work to make that happen. So I'll always be grateful to them for their work and that stuff um, and that's why I'm very careful not to if I see a new thing coming out or I see something that I don't quite understand I try to understand it before I go oh that's that's shit and, and 
and it won't work because I've had that said about my work and it's um it was untrue. <laughs> yeah. So. Right. Hmm. Hmm. So are there any current challenges that you're facing? Any anything current that you're trying to work through, that you're trying to overcome? You know, knowing that as artists evolve with the work and as we gain more experience in this industry, working with different mediums, you know, we always encounter different challenges and through different stages, right? Yeah. You know, um, for example, Guy Aitchison's working on overcoming challenges now that he didn't have, you know, 20 years ago. Um, Philip yeah. is now working on overcoming different things and trying to accomplish different things that, you know, he didn't even think of 20 years ago. Is there yeah. anything now that you're really kind of looking at as far as something that you're trying to achieve or overcome um, that you think you might want to share with us? Yeah, I think um, I think for me, it's just, um, it's going to sound so silly when I've been tattooing for 20 years, but it's it, having the confidence in my own work to trust that what I'm doing is the right thing to do. Because I think early on, especially being a self-taught artist, um, so much of your learning comes from finding influences and emulating them. So you, you find an artist that's, that's phenomenal and you go, how did they do that? And then you try to emulate what they do in your own way. Um, and for me, it's sort of looking at my work more objectively um, and seeing that all those skills are there. I just need to say what I'm going to say in my, my own language, especially in tattooing. I've started to do it with the painting. Um, but with the tattooing, I think, um there's a there's a language that is there um and it is starting to sort of come through in the in the in the in the style of work that i do especially when i get to just pick whatever when people give me complete freedom um and i think that um a, a big fear of mine coming through my career is that i would end up an older tattooist that their work looked the same as it did 10 years ago or 20 years ago um, and hadn't kept up. Um, and with what I'm doing, I don't think like I can, I, I love what other people are doing and tattooing and, and, and it influences me, and, um, especially a lot of the, the newer people to the, to the, to the industry, the, the shit they're doing is phenomenal, man. And I, I'm impressed on a daily basis with some of the stuff I see, but I think, um, doubling down on my ideas, um, rather than right rather than trying to chase other people's ideas is, is the, is the hardest thing for me at the moment is getting over that mental, that self-imposed mental block where I think I, I by default think other people's ideas are more legitimate than my own. So I think trusting the skill that I have to inform what I'm doing next is my next sort of hurdle. If, if that makes sense. It does indeed. It does. Mm. Something I think we all struggle with is, you know, that kind of self-validation. Mm. Um, you know, so I, I think you hit the nail on the head there. And it's something that it's not just you. Uh, there's I know a few other artists that are out there that are s struggling with the same thing. So thank you for sharing mm. that. Um, if you had to give one piece of advice to any kind of a new budding artist out there, what would it be? Oh, tattoo artist or artist in general? A any any kind of artist you can imagine. If there's two separate answers, we'll take you know one of each. Um, yeah, I think I think I think yeah, I think the art artists in general, and and I think this would pertain to tattooists as well as that. It's, it's, um, you know, don't be afraid to really explore the limits of what you're doing or to do stuff that's outside of the box as, as to what you're used to doing. Um, but try to do that with one foot firmly planted in your fundamentals, you know, like just basic contrast and shapes and, and, um, and, and weights of images and, and composition. Um, if you can have those down pat, then you can do anything you want to do with them. Um, and it's and and when you 
when you lose sight of some of those fundamentals, that's when things can go a little bit sideways. So I think that's, I think that's sort of the big piece of advice is, you know, one head in the stars, but feet on the ground, you know? I feel you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and this is always a question that I like to ask uh, to kind of cap off the interview uh, because it, it's always interesting to see the answers that I get to it. But what okay. truths have you found that are simple but not easy about technique, process, uh, the industry, fine art, anything in general? Oh, what truths have I found that are simple but not easy? Um, I think in, I think for if we're talking the sort of tattoos and technique, you know, it, it's the the most simple thing is 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 you know make sure your tattoo is solid, <laughs> make sure it's solid and it's in there. You can do anything you want. You can do the craziest compositions and and you know just mind blowing geometric stuff or, or colors or whatever but get it in there get it in there get it fucking solid um and if you're not doing that then it's then you're wasting your time you know your your, your first job is, is is to do a good job and and then it's to be impressive you know i think i think that's the that's the big truth it doesn't it doesn't matter how wild the shit you're doing is if you're not doing it properly then right you're wasting your time uh, that's you know that's that's an awesome answer um no, thanks man um, i'm personally gonna hold on to you know and <laughs> i think you summed it up when you said you know your first job is to do a good job mm. you know impress people second but do a good job first you know that's it's true. Anytime I've come that's unstuck in, in what I'm doing or any any time I've done something that I've been less than happy with it, that the, I've lost sight of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Anything else uh, you would like to add today? Um, you are teaching at Paradise Gathering this year. That is correct. Yeah. 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 I'm doing, uh, I'm going to do a, a speed painting sort of a course thing. So a couple of hours and we'll, jam out some a la prima oil paintings together it'll be uh, it'll be super cool i do um quite a lot of that uh, i've posted on my instagram so if you want to see any of those i did it didn't it get, it's basically you do 10 paintings in one hour um so it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of fun i'll be doing that and um yeah what else oh i'll be at the rites of passage tattoo convention in melbourne in two weeks and um i'm exhibiting my paintings in um in wellington and and possibly further afield later in the year so keep an eye on that yeah awesome awesome and how can we reach you if say we want to try and get tattooed by uh if we wanted to take a look at your work your instagram or anything like that how would we get a hold of you yep so um yep the majority of my later stuff is on instagram so um that's at lhp andy um and um yeah if you want to make a booking or anything like that it's um just hit me up through that and i can i can give you the rest of it my my um website is all painting stuff so that's um andrew swarbrick art.com yeah andrew swarbrick art.com and um uh, yeah that's the they're the main two ways you can get a hold of me just just hit me up send me a message um I uh, I spend far too much time online, so I'll probably be there um, waiting to talk to you. But yeah, those are the those are the best two ways to get a hold of me: Instagram um, at lhpnd or andrewswarbrickart.com. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been absolutely enlightening. Um, thank you. You know, thank you for jumping on and doing this interview. I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, and I can't wait to get paradise and hang out. And maybe yeah, do man. some and yeah, it's same. gonna be a blast yeah man it's gonna be awesome awesome well um i'm actually going to uh end the stream here uh so thank you once again for your time i will see everyone again next week uh on monday at noon i believe we've got mickey schlick uh in. 
to talk about some other new exciting ventures he's doing. So uh, until then, stay tuned. Keep your hands uh, busy. Keep that heart coming. And uh, we'll see everyone next week. Cheers. <laughs>